So would you then say it was actually a good thing that Eve took of the fruit? I would say it was a great thing. And that is a can of worms. Hello Saints, my name is Jeff. I am a pastor exploring everything I can about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I'm actually joined in this video by a Latter-day Saint. This is Greg Matson from Quick Media. Thank you for joining me. Glad to be here, very excited about this talk this discussion we're gonna have. Absolutely. I've been wanting to make a video for a long time answering a question that I frequently get on the channel, and that is when I'm making reference to the core and essential doctrines that pretty much all mainstream Christians agree on, what are those doctrines? Maybe another way that I could put it is, what exactly does Pastor Jeff believe? And not only am I wanting to clarify what those doctrines are, but I wanna sit with a Latter-day Saint to help me understand where there are similarities, but differences in some of these beliefs. Because one thing that happens a lot with Latter-day Saints and especially evangelicals is, since we don't take the time to understand one another, we talk past one another. And you're gonna make sure we don't do that. Well, I don't know if I'm gonna make sure, but we're gonna make sure. We're gonna make sure, we'll do it together. Team effort. Awesome. Let's do this. So what I wanna do now is go through six primary essential core doctrines. I could say with a great deal of confidence that all mainstream Christian denominations would agree on. There might be another level, which we would call secondary doctrines, where there would be a lot of disagreement, on issues like speaking in tongues or infant baptism or predestination. But those are issues that though we might passionately disagree about, we call them secondary issues. That the Bible gives us the freedom to agree to disagree on those without it impacting our salvation or impacting our eternal destiny. When it comes to these core or essential doctrines, they, they really do make up what we believe to be the parameters that the Bible does not allow us to disagree on if we're going to have a proper understanding of what God has revealed in his word about his will and about his character. Would you say that these are like saving doctrines? I don't know if I would say they're saving doctrines in the sense that by believing in them you are saved, but they are definitely key to properly understanding what salvation is and what salvation means. Okay, so let's start with the first doctrine that all mainstream Christians are going to adhere to and agree on, and it's gonna to come to no surprise to anybody, even if you're a Latter-day Saint, and that is the full sufficient authority of the Bible as it exists in the Old and the New Testament. Um, we believe that the scriptures are inspired and that comes from 2 Timothy chapter three, and it's not inspired like, oh, I just heard a song and now I'm inspired to write a poem. It's actually inspired in the sense that it's actually breathed out by God, that the Old Testament and the New Testament were actually breathed out by God and influenced and um, inspired and formed the, the writers of scripture to write down exactly what he wanted to have revealed. And as a result of that, there's a belief that we don't need any other scripture or, or objective truth rallying point beyond the Bible to inform us of what God has revealed to us. So Latter-day Saints, on the other hand, hold to a different belief when it comes to the authority of, specifically, the Old and New Testaments. So help me understand how Latter-day Saints might view that doctrine compared to what is taught in Latter-day Saint tradition. So we hold the Bible as scripture. We believe in the Bible, we study the Bible. Um, we would look at it as the word of God. Uh, this year in Come Follow Me, we're studying the New Testament, but we wouldn't see it as completely infallible, hmm. right? So there would be some loose areas there where we would say maybe through translation or interpretation, um, scribal errors even, or there may be some issues within the Bible. And it's not the only authority for us. And I know that this is sometimes an issue in discussion on other doctrines, probably every doctrine. 100%, yes. Yeah, is that, you know, it, is this biblical? And for us, it's like, okay, we, we think it's probably biblical, but we also would be pulling from the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Book of Mormon, and from living prophets. Right. And so we have other sources besides the Bible. That's, and that has been incredibly, not only helpful, but critically important for me to grasp and to understand. And it has taken me some time to understand it. And the best example I use to this is if in a mainstream Christian context, somebody states something or claims something, 
and we believe it violates the Bible, we're going to take the Bible to them and say, what you're saying is out of line because it does not match with the Bible or it's not found in the Bible. If I would do that to a Latter-day Saint, mm -hmm. a Latter-day Saint, correct me if I'm wrong, is gonna be like, so what? We have other sources of revelation that we can go to in order to be informed about certain claims or ideas that allow us to say the Bible isn't the only authority mm -hmm. that we go by. Yeah, I think that's true. I think it's also true that where you might have something in the Bible that says, you know, God is spirit, right? Mm -hmm. or uh, God is one, they're all one. We would say, yes, that's biblical. We just might have a different interpretation mm. of what's in there. And that different interpretation may come from those other sources. Sure. Okay, the next one is equally as not surprising as the one that we just talked about. And that is that in mainstream Christianity, and in this one I will say this is Protestant and Catholic traditions, we passionately adhere to the belief that God is the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, infinite, triune God who exists in three persons as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons why this is incredibly important to us and very crucial is because we believe that it is consistently talked about throughout the Old and the New Testament that there is only one God. The, the idea of monotheism is central, critical, and core to every aspect of what we believe God has revealed about himself and about salvation. Um, Latter-day Saints have a differing view. In fact, the Trinity is probably the most challenged doctrine that I experience in conversation with Latter-day Saints. So help me understand that. Yeah, so I think uh, the big difference there, obviously, is that we look at, we have a Godhead as compared to the Trinity. If you go through the intercessory prayer and Jesus is talking to the Father and he's saying, you know, I would like our disciples, can I, our disciples be one with us, with you, mm -hmm. as I am one with you, or one with me like I am one with you. That's how we would look at one. Or in Genesis with uh, Adam and Eve, you know, they're going to become one flesh. Sure. Right, and so in Hebrew, that's echad, and sometimes echad is used as union and not just as a single digit, a n number. Mm. So we look at that more like union, and so three different beings, one in purpose, one in mind, probably one in covenant, I would say, even. And one in Godhead. One in Godhead, yes. So would it be accurate to say then that where uh, mainstream Christians believe that there is one God represented with three persons, Latter-day Saints would say there is one Godhead, but they are three distinct beings. Or just the opposite of what you said. You could say there are three persons Okay. that end up being like one God. That end up being like one God. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah. but three beings. Yeah. Okay. So let's just talk about a little bit more than just about the nature of God when it comes to his attributes, mm -hmm. where we believe that God is eternal, though he exists and he is fully present outside and within the created universe. He is otherly, meaning he, he is not bound by this universe. Mm -hmm. So um, he has eternally existed really in a state that defies our comprehension um, because he is eternal, because he is omnipresent, because he is all powerful. He's not bound to the same laws when it comes to origin, like anything within this created universe mm -hmm. usually has an origin. God is, he's the great I am. And even though that seems abstract in some ways, that doesn't mean that he's not incredibly personal. Mm -hmm. So he has entered into his creation to make sure that even though he is outside of it when it comes to what we can comprehend, he is so knowable, deeply personal, deeply loving, and can still be experienced in the context of relationship. So as I talk through some of those attributes of how we view God in that sort of transcendent sense, where would Latter-day Saints fall when it comes to uh, seeing that similarly or differently? You know, I'd say that um yeah, we do see God probably as outside to some degree of creation and outside to some degree of time, so to speak. But he's also who he is because of following truth, right? Mm -hmm. He's also who he is because of following what is righteous. The idea in Latter-day Saints, the plan of salvation with Latter-day Saints is that we want to be more like him by following that truth and being more righteous like he is. And so, uh, I would say it's, it's kind of a gray area for Latter-day Saints to think of where he would be outside of time 
and, and space, et cetera, creation, certainly different than what we are. Mm. But I don't, that's probably a little more philosophical area that we probably don't, don't enter into as much. It, would it be considered Latter-day Saint orthodoxy to say that God has been on a path of progression and is still on a path of progression? Mm. So we believe God is perfect. Okay. And, and that if he wasn't perfect, he would cease to be God. Right? We, that is something that is doctrinal for us. So he is already perfect as far as a progression. But um, where that growth would come from for, some, for God would be in a, an increased amount of glory. Hmm. And that glory would come from his purpose. You know, in, in, in one of our scriptures, it says that the purpose of God is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Hmm. That is his purpose. And so he does that through creation. He th does that through love. He does that through a plan to bring us back to him. So in that sense, there's still growth and joy. And we believe he, he's, he feels those same passions, right? He would have joy over these things. He would sorrow over our mistakes, mm -hmm. right? Our sin. But he's also going to have joy. And therefore, that is his purpose, is to create, to have children, and to watch us grow and learn. Hmm. So let's talk about mankind for a second, which is the third one that we we're gonna be talking about. And that is that um, all mainstream Christians believe that we were created in God's image, that every human that has ever existed was created in God's image. That as God was going about the creating of all things, whether it's on earth or anywhere else in the universe, the, the millions or billions of different varieties of things that exist, even in the spirit world with angels and some of those other things and the heavenly creatures, that when he created mankind, he said, this creation is the most like me and we are created in his image, which is why we have a, a sanctity and a reverence that is just intrinsically interwoven into our being. And that when Adam and Eve, who were the first humans, were created and placed in God's presence in an unbroken relationship, they experienced relationship with him in the way that God always intended. And when Satan deceived Eve and sin entered the world, it was the most catastrophic tragedy in the history of existence because mankind at that point could not be in holy God's presence because now sin and disobedience had entered in. So we maintain our image bearing status, but it's marred, mm -hmm. it's tarnished, and now we are in need of a savior. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna get so much into the saving work of Christ yet, but when it comes to us being created in God's image and how that sort of plays into the narrative of humanity, even at the very beginning in the garden, help me understand how Latter-day Saints understand the image of God. I think one of the big differences with Latter-day Saints is the doctrine of the pre-mortal existence. Mm. And when you look at that and you bring that framework in, it's, I think it's a little easier to understand where we would come from on this. We believe a plan was already put in place in the pre-mortal world with God when we lived with God previously. Mm -hmm. The plan included coming down Adam and Eve coming down to earth, there would be a fall. Mm -hmm. um, there would require a, to have a savior because of that, but that we were meant to come down in a fallen world. Mm. We were meant to come down in a fallen world where we would face adversity, be given the opportunity to choose between good and evil, and most importantly, to become, right? To become more like God in that sense. And tied to that whole pre-mortal existence, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is the understanding then that we are the actual offspring of God, yes. or of Heavenly Father. And I know that you don't reference this being often because there's, there's so much mystery surrounding it, but that we are the offspring of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. Spiritually. Spiritually, right, before we came to earth. So when you are saying that we are created in the image of God, we are the actual offspring. Correct, okay. yes. So would you then say that in the Latter-day Saint context, it was actually a good thing that Eve took of the fruit or a bad thing? Because I just said in our context, it was a tragedy of tragedies. Yeah. I would say it was a great thing. Okay. Yes. Okay. And that is a can of worms that yes. we could probably talk about for the next hour, which is why I'm going to come on your podcast and we're Absolutely. going to have a conversation on the garden. That'll be an excellent conversation. Yes, we're, we're definitely going to do that. Okay, so this next one technically should probably be three or four. 
um, doctrinal statements that mainstream Christians are going to embrace, but I'm combining it into one just for time's sake and to, to make this a little bit more direct and concise. Mm -hmm. And that is the belief that Jesus Christ is truly and fully God and came to earth and truly and fully became a man. Mm -hmm. And as he did that, he was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He pulled back the curtain of God's heart and will for mankind in his teaching. He suffered on our behalf. He was crucified on our behalf to pay the penalty of our sin. And his blood that was shed on the cross is essentially the final atonement that was preceded by all of the atoning sacrifices in the Jewish hmm. construct. And he was buried. He rose again on the third day. He ascended and now sits at the right hand of the Father. You're explaining the LDS Jesus. Okay, so this is one of those, this is one of those <laughs> moments where we're going to say, we say all of these same things. Mm -hmm. And the last one, and I'm not going to say most importantly, but pinnacally important, he's coming back. Okay, so help me understand, based on everything that I just said there, how Latter-day Saints view those various aspects of the, the Christology or the doctrine of Christ. So one important doctrine with Latter-day Saints is that when you, go, when you look back to the Old Testament, when you say, who's God, and you're looking at the Old Testament, we believe that Jesus Christ is Jehovah. Mm -hmm. So that individual speaking with Moses and et cetera, that is, to a, that is Jesus Christ, that being who is Jesus Christ. And oftentimes when God is referenced in the Old Testament, for us, you're usually talking about Jehovah who becomes Jesus Christ when he is born. Hmm. But he would have been uh, a son of God, a literal offspring of the Father. Just like we are. Just like we are, okay. right? But far more progressed, right? He had progressed much further. He was the greatest among all of us. And he offered in that premortal world to be that sacrifice so that that whole plan we talked about could take place. And so at that point, in fact, if you looked at Revelation 12, there were those that went with the plan of the Father mm -hmm. that Jehovah supported and said he would be the sacrifice and those that did not. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I want to bring out, just so you have the opportunity to speak to it, because this is one of the um, concepts that a lot of mainstream Christians are going to zero in on when it comes to not only understanding, but even trying to articulate Latter-day Saint beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that is when you say that we are all the offspring of God and Jesus is the offspring of God, that is also tied into the belief that Lucifer mm. is an offspring of God and is our brother and Jesus' brother. Is that correct? Right, spiritually, yeah, spiritually in that right. sense. Yes, that he would have been, because I believe that Protestants would say that Lucifer was a creation of God. Is that right? 100%, yeah, okay. he was an angel. He was an angel. Okay, so for us, he's a creation of God, but he would have been a son also, like you're a son of God and Jehovah was a son of God. Sure. And he just was not created evil, mm -hmm. but he chose evil. Mm. And, so, and many followed after him. Yeah. And that last statement you made, we would agree with when it comes to him choosing evil and those yeah. choosing to follow him. And I would, I would add on to that, that he's, in, therefore, because he is an offspring of God, in that world of angels and the premortal world, and including God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, we would all be the same species. Mm -hmm. We're okay. all the same. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I want to kind of also speak to as it's tied to uh, who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish, mm -hmm. I'm going to speak to something in that category that touches on a previous one just for redundancy purposes, because sometimes that's the best way to learn. Mm -hmm. And that is where a lot of Latter-day Saints will zero in on the Garden of Gethsemane as to where some key atoning work was done, where a, a evangelical or a Protestant or any mainstream Christian is going to go to the Bible and say, blood isn't referenced in Gethsemane except for one of the gospels. Mm -hmm. And we don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says that any sort of atoning work was done at Gethsemane. The atoning work of Christ was done on the cross. I'm showing you my Bible, Latter-day Saint. What do you say to that? Yeah. So if you go back, as I believe this would be mainline Protestant belief that in the fall, when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, they brought into the world both 
physical death and spiritual death. Yes. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So what we would look at is looking at those two different deaths. The Garden of Gethsemane is atonement for the spiritual death. Okay. okay. So that's payment for the sins. That's where we believe that payment for sins happen. And then the cross would, and then of course the resurrection would be the physical death okay. on that end. And we're role playing a little bit here. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm role playing as an evangelical, which is easy because I am. I would say, but where is that found in the Bible, Greg? Mm -hmm. And your response would be? I would say it may not be specifically in there, mm -hmm. but it has been shown to us in other places, whether it's current prophets and other scripture, etc. Other revelation that has been sort of metabolized and presented as doctrine within the Latter-day Saint teaching. Correct. Now, I would ask you, mm -hmm. what, what is the purpose of the Garden of Gethsemane? What happened there? It is critically important and significant because what it does is it shows the, it's, this is a very academic term that I, I don't love using, but it's one that maybe a lot of people might know. Mm -hmm. And that is the hypostatic union of Christ. It's what I was talking about a second ago, where we say that God is 100% man and 100% God. What Jesus is demonstrating as he is literally standing on the precipice of his own physical death is the anguish that he as 100% man is experiencing in that moment. And that is important because it shows, for example, in a book like Hebrews, where it says that Jesus was tempted in all of these ways that we now know that we have a great high priest who can sympathize mm. with us. And there was a temptation of sorts where he said, Lord, if possible, can you take this cup and, and, and pass it? I don't, is there a way for this not to happen this way? Mm. But ultimately, your will, not mine which then also exhibits Jesus's not only obedience to the Father and submission to the Father's will, but his love for the Father mm. and his love for us. So it's kind of his struggle getting to that point of the cross then. Yeah, we, we can relate to Jesus in that moment mm -hmm. because I think any human would say if we were in his position, we would feel the same way. Mm -hmm. and, and how beautiful is it that he said, I'm gonna go through it anyway, like yeah. that, his love just sort of explodes onto the scene right there. Absolutely. So that you can't then see when he's arrested and he's tried and he has conversations with Pilate and Herod and even he's hanging on the cross. It isn't just some vain, pious act of a deity. Mm -hmm. We see the love on display there in the garden. Yeah. And I see that difference, that discrepancy between evangelicals and Latter-day Saints because obviously, I mean, you use the cross as a symbol. We don't use the cross as a symbol. Right. Because our focus is just, it's there in that garden. Sure. Not that the cross isn't important to us. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. But we believe that that garden is where, is where it, it's, kind of like a, it's kind of like Moses ascending to Sinai. It's kind of a, a temple type of a, a imagery mm. where, where he's going up the mountain or the hill, whatever it might be. And that is where that payment, that atonement for all of our sins is gonna happen. Sure, and we would say that the cross is our greatest joy, the cross. Calvary is our greatest joy because our sins were washed away. And the resurrection is our greatest hope because we can then look forward to a future where we will share in Christ's resurrection physically and spiritually and live with him forever. That's good to know. All right, so this next one is going to be interesting because we're going to be talking about the term church. Okay, and it'll be interesting if you're a Latter-day Saint to hear some insight from a mainstream Christian as how do we reconcile all of these churches? How, how can you say that there is a church if you've got the Lutheran church and the Methodist church and the Baptist church and the Catholic church? So we believe that when Jesus came and said, I'm physically here, but I'm leaving, anybody who has put their faith in me and has, has been filled with the Holy Spirit is now my physical representation here on earth. So you might be a part of a denomination that's called the Lutheran Church or the Baptist Church or the Catholic Church, but that we believe that the true church is anybody who has put their faith in Jesus, born again by the Spirit of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, and is now taking the hope of Jesus into the rest of the world as if Jesus himself was still here going into the uttermost parts of the world spreading the gospel. And some of the things that we do within the churches is we make sure that we are gathering, we make sure that there is authority and organization because we believe that God is not a God of chaos so that within every different expression though you might have a different worship style you might have different secondary doctrines that you might passionately hold to that there's also some governance and order and covering over those things mm -hmm. and also that we are following the commands that Jesus 
gave us when he came and established ordinances like baptism and communion. We believe those things were commanded and we should do them. But that doesn't mean that doing those things save us. So that we, we are baptized because we are commanded to and it is a proclamation to everyone around us that we are a follower of Jesus and we have been born again. And there's even spiritual significance to that experience. But we don't believe that if you aren't baptized, then you aren't saved. Mm -hmm. And the same thing would go for communion. When we gather together as churches, we participate in the Lord's Supper to remember his death on the cross, the bread being his body that was broken, which shows his love for us, the blood, which is his blood that was shed on the cross, which is a representation of the new covenant that he established. So we participate in those things because we are commanded to and because they are edifying to us, though those things don't save us. Now there, go, now there are going to be some denominations that put a very strong requirement on those things. And there will be certain expressions like the Catholic Church and even some very small sort of fringe Protestant groups that will say you must be baptized in order to get into heaven. Mm -hmm. But that isn't necessarily widely accepted across all denominations. And as Latter-day Saints, you consider yourselves part of the restored church. Mm -hmm. And one might even say the true church. Yes. So help me unpack that a little bit more. So for us, it's a matter of authority. It's a matter of priesthood authority, not just a matter of accepting Christ. So for example, uh, the best way to describe this is to go back and say, the belief, the doctrine of, of Latter-day Saints is that there was a great apostasy. And somewhere probably early second century AD, the, the apostles are all gone and the priesthood is lost. Therefore, that priesthood had to be restored. And that was key to everything. You could not begin a church without that priesthood authority. So our belief is that first John the Baptist comes back, gives the, gives the ironic priesthood to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, and then later Peter, James, and John come and give the Melchizedek priesthood to, mm. to Joseph Smith. So, Without that priesthood authority for us, there is no way to actually build Christ's church. But you have to have that authority in place. Not that the doctrines before weren't true or that anyone who accepted Christ before then didn't actually accept Christ, but then to actually form the church, you would need that authority. And I'm gonna take this and tie it to something that we didn't speak about earlier, but is still really important. This is where the Book of Mormon comes in. This is the importance of the Book of Mormon because as Joseph Smith had an encounter with Heavenly Father and Jesus, and it was revealed to him that God was going to use Joseph mm -hmm. to essentially reveal to the world his intention for his true church. Right. That was tied mm -hmm. to Joseph then going and um, getting the gold plates and translating under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Book of Mormon, which is why the Book of Mormon is really pinnacle when it comes to the backstory and restoration of this true church. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think that's accurate. In other words, the, the Book of Mormon, why does the Book of Mormon play such a role on that? It's because there is, it's part of restore, the restoration. Hmm. It's part of scripture that we would need for the latter days. Uh, it has really, it supports the Bible. We would look at it as being a, you know, we call it another testament of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It supports the Bible, but also probably in some areas clarifies mm. the Bible, which would mm -hmm. probably be very difficult to hear as yeah. a Protestant. Uh, yeah, a mainstream Christian who believes in sola scriptura would then recoil at that, obviously yes. because we believe in the full sufficiency of the Bible. All right, so then even as I was talking about baptism and I even used the word ordinances, Help me understand what a Latter-day Saint is going to think about with even the, the word ordinance and mm -hmm. how Latter-day Saint temples play a role in some of that. So an ordinance is not just a, an action, mm -hmm. but for us, it's a covenant. So for example, baptism is an ordinance. And in the Book of Mormon, we learn about covenants that you take on with baptism. One of them, for example, is bearing each other's burdens similar to what Christ did in Gethsemane, mm -hmm. where he bore our burdens, right? He bore everyone's burdens. So taking on the name of Christ says that we're going to take on his purpose also. And that's what baptism is for. So it's kind of a physical manifestation of, yes, I accept Christ, I accept his church, and uh, I, I want to be more like Christ and bear these burdens. But that means there's a covenant that goes along with it. And as you go through the ordinances and you go up through the temple, it's not just an ordinance that you do, it is a covenant that you're making. 
And so we would see baptism as the gate, kind of on what we call the covenant path. Mm -hmm. And then as you go through the covenant path, you're binding yourself more and more to God with each one of those ordinances. And there's five key ordinances as you go through the temple. And from mm -hmm. what I've recently been learning, because I went through a temple for the first time the other day, is that you first go through the temple to make those covenants for yourself mm -hmm. uh, the first time you go through. But after you do them for yourself, you do them for others. Help me understand why you would continue to go through a temple and carry out these ordinances. So the primary reason to keep going through after you've gone through for yourself is to do temple work. And temple work for us is taking on other names, people that have passed away already, who have not had the opportunity to accept those covenants, to go through those ordinances. So that's why family history is such an important thing for, for Latter-day Saints. We do the research, we do the genealogy, and, and, and pull these names and then bring them to the temple and do the work for them by proxy. A lot of times the best thing you can do is actually take your own family names. Uh, my wife did this, for example, for, for uh, her mom for some things and, and other members of her family. I've done this for members of my family. But to go through those covenants for them by proxy. So by doing so, they have the opportunity to accept those covenants and those ordinances or reject them. Mm -hmm. So that covenant path, we believe, is required by everyone. And the only way you can have that done is in a physical body. So therefore, as those of us who are living in mortality, we use our physical body by proxy for somebody else so that they can have the ordinances and, and accept or refuse them. So with all that being said, then Latter-day Saints would believe that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the true church. So rather than what we would say is multiple expressions of different denominations and churches, the church is made up of, the body of Christ is made up of anybody who's put their faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. You would say, well, we believe the church is anybody who has gone through the saving ordinances as taught in the Latter-day Saint doctrines. Yeah, and I think there's another distinction that's important. So we, we would say that because we believe that that's, that the living prophet has the authority. He's not, it's not just a calling, right? Mm -hmm. He has been given the authority to have that position and the structure of the church with the apostles, etc., is in place. So we would say that it is the true church, but that doesn't mean we would say that we're the only Christians, mm. right? So we would, we would say anyone who believes and professes Christ as their savior mm -hmm. would be okay. a Christian. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay, so the last doctrine that I wanna talk through that all mainstream Christians are going to embrace and actually eagerly anticipate is the return of Jesus. He will be coming back. When he returns, there will be a resurrection, a resurrection either unto life or a resurrection unto judgment, depending on whether or not you put your faith in Christ. And there will be the full consummation of all things, which is essentially where God makes everything right and he makes everything new. So that's where you see the new heavens and the new earth. There are some beliefs within various mainstream Christian expressions that might get into some of the specifics as to when people are resurrected, whether there's going to be a tribulation, whether there's going to be a millennial reign of Jesus on earth, and whether we are taken up with him and resurrected before the millennial reign or during or mm. after. And there are a lot of people that will actually very passionately debate some of those things. But the main aspects of the doctrine of Christ's return, what we would call eschatology, is he's coming back, there will be a resurrection, there will be a judgment, and there will be a full wrapping up or consummation of all things. So what do Latter-day Saints believe in that regard? All of those things. Okay. Uh, I could get a little more specific, though. I would say that part of that coming back in a second coming of Jesus Christ has a lot to do with us. In other words, are we preparing for that? He may not, the timing of him coming back has a lot to do with, for us, the growth of the church and are we preparing the world for his second coming? Secondly, there are different resurrections in our doctrine. So there would be a re first resurrection that would happen at his, has, at, at his second coming. That would be at the beginning of the millennial reign mm -hmm. of a thousand years. And then there's a second resurrection that would happen afterward in after the millennial reign. And I believe, and I'm not sure on this, but I think there's a third resurrection that comes in after that. There are variations of everything that you're explaining mm -hmm. in mainstream Christian doctrine mm -hmm. as well. So I really appreciate you helping me accurately 
understand and communicate where there are similarities and differences. Because as we've talked about before, so often we talk past one another yes. because we don't take the time to understand one another. Yeah, understanding is key. And I really appreciate coming in and talking this. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I, I love walking this out for myself personally, but walking it out with each other. Yeah, it's fun stuff. It's great stuff. Make sure you check out Greg Matson, Quick Media. It's a fantastic YouTube channel. He gets into all kinds of different topics. And um, are there any other ways that people can kind of check out your content? Quickmedia.com. Quick is C-W-I-C. It means alive and intelligent. It's an old English word, kind of like, if you look at King James version uh, language, it's like being quickened, right? So it's sure. C-W-I-C-Media.com or YouTube or any podcast medium you might use. Definitely. Awesome. Special thanks to Centerpoint Church in Orem, Utah for letting us shoot this video here while Greg and I were here in Utah. Please like this video, subscribe. If you want to support me on Patreon, feel free to do that, but you don't have to. Uh, either way, just come back for more videos because the conversation just, it's not going to stop. I don't think it's going to stop. We're going to keep going with this. So until next time, I'll see you later, Saints.